As you look at the Brexit process unfolding, Bob, what concerns you more? Uh, we hear different uh, versions of the schedule, which could be important in terms of whether the trade and the divorce proceedings happen Correct. at the same time or whether they are one after the other. Well, you know, apart from the uh, debate at the moment in the House of Lords, which then goes back to the Commons, I'm assuming that actually Article 50 probably will get triggered by the end of March. But there is a very fundamental problem here, which is that if you listen to um, Mr. Barnier from the European Union, um, his stance is very clear, which is that the European Union wants to negotiate firstly mm -hmm. the terms of exit, and there is discussion about an exit bill mm -hmm. of between 50 and 60 billion uh, euros. Uh, the British stance is that uh, the British want to negotiate simultaneously on an exit and on free trade deals or trade deals. Um, so you have that very fundamental difference between the stance of the British and the EU. And uh, until that difference is, is sorted out, I think actually the negotiations are just going to drag on in a very unsatisfactory I mean, in, way. In theory, we could spend a year and a half not, not deciding the well, we could negotiation end, strategy, let well, alone yeah, we, exactly. actually negotiate. Yeah, we could end up with gridlock. Mm. And then you have to ask the question, what happens after the two-year yeah. period? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be the negotiations about the negotiations. Mm. Uh, yes. uh, and whether it's 12 billion or 60 billion is anybody's guess. John Major, Anna and I were looking at this article this morning. John Major has, uh, obviously, he, he's talking in behalf of the Remain campaign. He says, in areas of reducing immigration, negotiating a free trade agreement into the, and paying into the bloc's budget, voters are going to face disappointment. This, of course, is a real directional uh, pop at Theresa May, that she's going to fundamentally not be able to deliver on Brexit promises. It's a, it's a reasonable take. He, he dealt with Europe during his time, didn't he? Um, absolutely. And, Badly, know, some would say. Well, but... well, well, certainly, it was very difficult, and he would be the first to admit it was very difficult, and he's made some very robust comments on the difficulty. Yes. <laughs> um, now, I think, you know, in terms of where we go from here, I think one has to accept that you know, negotiating about what the negotiations will be is difficulty number one. Mm. Uh, the actual negotiations and the timing and the sequence of the negotiations is going to be very difficult. And you have to ask the question, what happens at the end end of the two-year negotiating period. And I think one has to recognise that there is a extremely high probability uh, that at the end of the two years the negotiations will not be finished satisfactorily to either the point of the UK uh, or the European Union. So, you know, we could be having this conversation in four or five years' time. Yeah, would it give you more confidence in UK mm. assets, Bob, and you can tell us what confidence level you have right now, um, if there were a role for either Parliament or the wider public in saying yes or or no deal or no deal at the end of the negotiating process. Well, will it? If one sort of cuts through all the political rhetoric and just looks at the basic yeah. economics, um, I think one has to emphasise that you know the UK is currently following a super easy policy to support the economy. You no, know, sterling is undervalued. Monetary policy is easy. Fiscal policy, and we get the you know the budget next week. Fiscal policy is reasonably easy. So it's not surprising that actually, despite all this, the UK economy is doing quite well. The export numbers look good. Consumer spending is under. Some pressure as we're but that's coming seeing. through in these numbers overnight. I mean, yes. you, you paint a, a, a very supportive picture, and I think we... Well, policy is super... Policy is super supportive. Yeah. The consumer is not as convinced. This is the GFK consumer, household consumer right. index. It's below zero for the tenth month in a row. I just wonder to what extent is the edifice of post Brexit. We never really felt anything last year. We haven't triggered Article 50, but people are reading about it more. They're beginning to understand there's a bit more potential risk. Is the edifice of consumer confidence under pressure? Well, I think what's behind uh, that, that graph is, yeah. is actually very straightforward, which is that because of the devaluation of the pound, inflation is rising. And yeah. as we go into the second half of this year, don't be surprised by headline inflation numbers, you know, above 2.5%, potentially close to 3%, at a time when there is very little upward pressure on wages. So consequently, there is that squeeze on real incomes. And I think inevitably, therefore, we will get some consumer slowdown. Conversely, you know, public sector investment spending uh, and infrastructure spending remains high. Monetary policy remains easy. Sterling is undervalued. And actually, the UK is benefiting from the recovery and the strength, not just in the States, but also the Eurozone. Uh, and you know, the PMIs coming out of Europe remain very strong.